Welcome to the Lend Academy podcast, episode number 245. This is your host, Peter Renton, founder of Lend Academy and co-founder of the Lend at Fintech conference. Today's episode is sponsored by Lend at Fintech USA, the world's largest fintech event dedicated to lending and digital banking. It's happening on our new dates of September 30 and October 1 at the Javits Center in New York. This year, with everything that's been going on, there will be so much to talk about. It will likely be our most important show ever. So come and join us in New York to meet the people who matter, to learn from the experts and get business done. Lend it Fintech, lending and banking connected. Sign up today at lendit.com slash USA. Today on the show, I'm delighted to welcome Mayada El Zogby. She is the Managing Director of the Center for Financial Inclusion, also known as CFI. Now, CFI is an interesting organization. They're basically a think tank that is focused on responsible finance, inclusive finance, really, with a lot of consumer protection and with their goal of you know, enabling the 3 billion people who are currently left out of the financial system you know, and they're trying to bring them in and improve their lives. So we, we talk a lot about the mission that CFI is, is undertaking. We talk about some of the impact that they're having and the geographically where they're focusing, the types of population they're, they're looking at. We also talk in depth about the impact of the COVID-19 crisis, particularly the economic crisis that is, that is coming out of, out of this, that what that's going to have on the developing world. And, and we talk about some of the, the silver linings that actually could potentially be, uh, be a long-term impact there. And we also, we talk about what's what's going on with the, the gender gap. We talk about what their focus is on the future and much more. It was a fascinating episode. I hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the podcast, Mayada. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. So I'd like to get these things started by giving the listeners just some background. And uh, you've had an interesting career to date. And you know, why don't you just give the, the listeners some of the highlights, particularly what you did uh, before you got to CFI? Sure. So I've been in this inclusive finance field for 25 years, which is an incredibly long amount of time when I think back. And, and I see three kind of phases. So I started in my career in the microfinance field, and I was out working in developing countries. I lived in Gaza, Bosnia, Croatia, and Kosovo, basically setting up financial institutions. So that was kind of the first phase. And then I then spent 10 years as a consultant to donors, financial institutions, nonprofits, and I ran a small little consulting company called Banning Global in you know giving support in inclusive finance. And then the last 10 years, I spent at CGAP, which is uh, kind of a global think tank on inclusive finance based at the World Bank. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then let's, so CGAP stands for Consultative Group to Assist the Poor. Why don't you just tell us a little bit about the work you did there exactly? Sure. Yeah. So CGAP was created around 20 something years ago, and it is, it was essentially created as a member organization of, of the donors who were very interested in elevating at the time microfinance and then later inclusive finance. And it was basically a knowledge organization that initially served the donor community, donor and investor community, and then expanded to serve the broader inclusive finance industry. My role, I had very many different jobs at CGAP, but I started there uh, focusing on the donor and investor community. And I was based out of Paris. And basically, I, my, my focus was on how do we ensure that f- financing for the inclusive finance field, whether it was coming in the form of philanthropic capital or whether it was coming in the form of investment capital, was used effectively. And so what we, we did a lot of work to inform the donor and investor community in terms of data information. We also did a lot of technical assistance directly. We I used to do a lot of advisory work on donor strategies and, and that, that kind of that kind of thing. I then shifted and focused quite a bit on CGAP's own strategic vision and, and, and focus and supported just, you know, CGAP as this industry body has a very, very large constituency. So we spent 
about a year and a half engaging quite broadly with anyone who was interested in inclusive finance on guiding CGAP's work in the next kind of five-year phase. And so I did, I launched, I did the strategy work. We, we did a lot of uh, R&D research on trends and, you know, the critical things that CGAP needed to keep on its agenda. For example, you know, the, the growing digital divide, what do we do with, you know, people that are being left behind as uh, we move towards a digital economy and, and these kinds of things. And then my very, very last thing that I did at CGAP right before I, right before I left was reflecting back on why the inclusive finance field existed in the first place, which is what's the impact we're trying to have. Mm -hmm. And so we spent quite a bit of time trying to understand what does the evidence actually tell us about what we've done as an industry, as a field, and why is it that we haven't had the kind of impact that we wanted to have? We we achieved quite a lot in terms of access, uh, a a bit on usage, but we weren't really having kind of the impact that that we we wanted as an industry. So this was a very research-focused, initiative where we reflected on our theory of change. Do we have a, you know, clarity in terms of what we're trying to do and how we're trying to achieve it? Uh, we spent a lot of time, like I said, reviewing the evidence. And then the idea was to articulate a new narrative which around where inclusive finance uh, can actually lead to impact on people's lives. Mm-hmm. And so were you part of, but did you have anything to do with the global Findex database? Because I, I know it's a World Bank initiative. And it's some of the things that I know that actually your, your, your organization now, CFI, actually had a, a great study that they, they, they released after you know, analyzing, analyzing the, the Findex database where, and, and just basically pointing out what you just said there, where that really, while access has been improved, usage has still got a long way to go. And, um, mm-hmm. so, so do you have anything to do with that while you're at, uh, CGAP? So it's funny because, uh, when this initiative, when Findex was initially being discussed, it actually was offered to CGAP. And, and at the time, CGAP said we weren't, you know, we weren't the right organization for it. And that's why it went to the research department of the World Bank. Hmm. But CGAP was involved. And at various stages, I've been, you know, a peer reviewer on some of the questions and have, you know, validated findings in terms of specific regions of the world that I know well and so on. So it, it's, it's done in a very collaborative way. And, and CGAP is always involved in that process. Um, but the bank, the bank's research department actually is the one that, that does the data collection. Right, right. Okay. Anyway, let's move on to, uh, to CFI, which, uh, you know, you've, you've been, you've been there now for, well, a few months. Well, I think it was September, September last year, if my, if my memory serves me. And why don't you just maybe explain what you saw and the opportunity there and why, why you decided to take the job? Yeah, absolutely. So the main reason, you know, CGAP is kind of, is a place I loved. I have to be very honest about that. And, and there, and it was hard to leave. But when, the opportunity did come up at CFI. I was very intrigued. Uh, one of the reasons is the CFI was at this very interesting kind of inflection point um, in its history. It was a relative, it's a younger organization than CGAP, and it was, you know, created and had been managed up until that point by its founder, Beth Ryan. And so it was, a, it was at this very interesting point where it could actually go in many different directions. And it was best known for its work on consumer protection through the SMART campaign. Mm-hmm. And there was this real question of where could CFI go next? And that is really what attracted me. So I, I'm very passionate about inclusive finance. I, I feel like uh, there's so much to be done and we need more organizations that are actually pushing the frontier and that could experiment and could share knowledge and so on. And so I felt like CFI could really step up its work. And I, I, I saw this as a great opportunity for myself to kind of step into that space and take CFI in that direction. You know, because of my background with, with CGAP and because of my networks with the, with the donor community, I felt like this was something that could be really useful for CFI to continue. To, obviously, we'd be collaborating with lots of organizations, but bringing in some of the, the donor and investor experience that I have, I thought could be um, really helpful for the organization for its next phase. Right. Okay. So maybe just talk about that for a second. You know, what, what is the mission today of CFI and you know, wh- where, do you, where do you see it going? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the mission for the most part will stay the same. I mean, our mission is, you know, when you think about it, is that we, we really care about enabling you know, the 3 billion people who are left out of the financial system to participate more fully 
and also so that they can have impact on their lives. So that's, you know, that is a very kind of noble mission. And I think we, that we will continue to kind of work towards that. I think that what, what I see happening is that I, we'll probably expand our, our, our kind of our set of tools that maybe that uh, beyond what CFI has been doing in the past. And so I, wanna, I want to strengthen CFI's research and advocacy work. And so that's, and, and that, that's where I see spending a lot more effort than we've done in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, I also want to delve deeper into the kind of the, 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 the areas where the inclusive finance field have, have really struggled to identify viable solutions. So, you know, for example, there's, and I'll, I know we'll talk a lot more about our strategy moving forward uh, later in, in the interview, but, um, you know, there's a lot of people left behind still. And even though there's been a ton of work, for example, on reaching women, we as an industry are very far behind in terms of um, reducing the gender gap in access to finance, for example. So, you know, there are, there are certain areas where there's just, that have been kind of intractable, which I feel that we as, a, as an organization could, could devote a lot more effort in experimenting and testing some new approaches and uh, synthesizing the evidence. And, and, and helping providers, but also regulators, uh, policymakers, and others, and the donor community, of course, to make some real progress. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So then I'd, I'd be curious to get your take on the, the tools that when it comes down to boots on the ground, we're trying to get these 3 billion people to really engage with the, with the financial system. Obviously, there's technology has to be a part of that solution, given obviously this is a, this is a fintech podcast. I'm, I'm curious about how you view the way that the tools that need to be used on the ground, how do you view that as, as sort of the, an enabler to bring these, these 3 billion people into the financial system? Yeah. Yeah, no, there's, there's absolutely, you're 100% right. There's no question that technology has to be a major part of the solution. But there, there's still just so many things that haven't happened in a lot of countries to make that a reality for everybody. Um, and so you you do have very large groups of people who are still excluded from participation in the digital economy, from owning even cell phones. So there's huge amounts of work that needs to be done on that on that on the kind of the customer segment piece of it and the customer research side of it, and the customer capability piece of it that are actually preventing people from participating fully. So I, I see us doing a lot of work on that. There's believe it or not, still a lot of regulatory and policy issues that have to be addressed in order to, act, to actually allow providers to work in some of these markets. So we've seen, everybody knows, of course, East Africa, the East African success stories, but, you know, there's lots of other places in the world where, uh, you know, the market has been much slower and, and some of the bottlenecks are regulatory in nature. So there's a lot of work that has to happen on that side. The area that CFI has a ton of experience in, which I think we can really try to scale more broadly, um, which I think is actually holding some of the progress back, links to the consumer protection. So you, you see a lot of technological innovation that doesn't take into consideration the, the users and the risks that these particular users face. And so trust can be uh, enhanced if the proper consumer protections are actually embedded into products and the design of these products for low-income consumers. And so I, I see huge opportunity to actually embed consumer protection principles in, in technological innovation, enabling consumers to feel more comfortable and then participating more fully into the financial system. So there's a lot of, a lot of work that can be done uh, on all of these issues, and I think CFI is, is well-positioned to do that. Okay, so then... What what are the, the the populations that you're working with? I mean, where where are you primarily focusing your efforts? Because there's this obviously throughout the world there are there are different challenges. You've already mentioned Africa, but so to maybe tell us where and then the specific sort of demographics. I mean, is it is it is it really just anyone who's excluded? Are you, you've mentioned women. I mean, is there certain demographics you're more focused on than others? Yeah, no, it's a great question. So one of the benefits of CFI is geographically we're very open to where we work. We can work anywhere in the world, which is, which is great. When I was at CGAP, we, we had a, a narrower set of countries just because of our, the donor members really wanted us to concentrate very heavily in, in Africa, for example. 
CFI, because of its connections to Axion, we have a, a lot of a lot of experience and, and touch points in, in Latin America, but we also can work in Eastern Europe and work in Africa and, and Asia. We we can really cover the world. So geographically, in terms of segments and, and kind of the users, I mean, we've been prioritizing the so the excluded, of course, uh, and that tends to be women, farmers, you know, as, as smallholders, though rural communities. But also, we we are focusing quite heavily on micro and small enterprises because we do see that as a, a very important kind of economic player to support um, poor people's well-being. And so we are doing quite a lot of work on supporting micro and small enterprises' use of digital channels uh, participate and their own access to finance. So those are the kinds of things we've been focusing on. I mean, th- this is not forever. We can, we will of course change our priorities as the uh, as the markets evolve. Um, but the idea is that we're trying to fill knowledge gaps, and we're trying to identify, we're trying to help solve some of the problems that a, a private sector player on their own wouldn't be able to invest in. And so we want to use our, you know, publicly resourced capital or philanthropic capital to partner and to do research on some of the areas that a a private provider may not be able to do by themselves. Right, right. And so maybe we could just, you could just tell us a little bit about the relationship with Axion. I mean, we had Michael Schlein, the head of Axion on the show a couple of years ago, but are you, um, are you just a part of Axion? What's the relationship between CFI and Axion? Yeah. uh, I get this question a lot. And um, so it's a good question. So Axion is this incredible nonprofit that is, you know, been evolving over the years. And, you know, when it, so it used to be a microfinance network and over the years it's kind of evolved into, kind of, and you could call it kind of like a holding company that has a, a different funds that it invests with directly. It also has an advisory side. And then it, it created CFI as a public good for the inclusive finance industry. So we are housed inside Axion. So, you know, we share, we have, shared back office, so shared IT, shared HR, and so on. But we are fairly independent in terms of the voice and the, and the agenda that we work on. So, so we, it's, it's, in a way, we are you know, very, very privileged to be sitting in, an, in a nonprofit that allows us that kind of freedom. We also have uh, a separate advisory council that, that uh, directs CFI's technical areas of focus. Um, and these are just individuals from different organizations around the uh, around the world who who are, come from the inclusive finance field or the private sector who can actually help connect us to knowledge and information technical support and so on um, and so we are quite independent from Axion even though we you know we are housed in it right okay that's good 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 to know I, I... I appreciate the clarity there. Now, you know, we are, we're over halfway through this interview and we still haven't mentioned, uh, the coronavirus or the crisis caused by, uh, you know, the, the COVID-19. And I, I imagine that it's impact, it's impacting everybody. And I imagine it's impacting CFI as well. Maybe why don't you just start off with a, uh, like a, a high level kind of what, how are you, because obviously the economic crisis is really just beginning and it's going to continue and there's many many countries in the world where the the virus is really just beginning so how is how is the you know the economic conditions that have changed in recent weeks how is that impacting the work you do yeah no it's impacting essentially everything we're doing because we've we've really felt the need to pivot our agenda so i was when i came in i was very focused on you know, what's lacking in the inclusive finance field? What could we do? Um, and then, and so we were on this path to develop a strategy and then all of a sudden COVID-19 hit and we realized, okay, all of that can wait and we need to be prioritizing the needs of low-income people around in the developing world. So what, what, what's happening to them? How can we help donors and investors and, and, and others understand their plight? Uh, and and how can we advocate on their behalf? So we've really shifted our research agenda pretty m- substantially, and uh, we're we're spending quite a lot of time uh, doing. We're going to be doing um, panel research in in minimum five uh, developing countries where we're trying to understand the COVID nineteen impact on micro and small enterprises, and we're doing it in this. We're doing it through kind of a panel survey process where we're going to be interviewing the same set of micro and small enterprises 
every two months or over a year to try to see the trajectory of COVID-19 on on their operations initially as the crisis increases in, in their countries, but then eventually, hopefully, as they recover. And we want to see how they're able to how they're able to recover, how they're using financial services, whether and how they are uh, moving towards accessing more digital channels, whether they are moving some of their sales online and so on. So we're going to be tracking that. We're also recognizing that the institutions that serve the BOP are also being impacted quite substantially. And there's our, our industry is mobilizing quite um, rapidly on this issue because we were very concerned that the financial service providers themselves are, are suffering you know, liquidity is the biggest issue here. And so that's what it is today. But then down the line, we're talking about solvency could be a real problem. And so there's a huge amount of work that needs to come, you know, organizations need to come together to try to see what can be done to actually protect these institutions so that we don't have, um, they, you know, so they don't, they don't die in, in, in the course of this uh, pandemic. So we're doing quite a lot in terms of the investor community, bringing the investor community together. We house one of the things that CFI houses is what's called the Financial Inclusion Equity Council. So it's uh, some of the leading equity investors that we, you know, we we basically have this platform where they share they share knowledge, they uh, exchange information, and so on. And so we want to elevate that work. Um, and we're currently in discussions with CGAP and other organizations that that work with investors to really look for a an industry response. From the investor community to support the institutions that are impacted uh, by COVID-19. And then also we're looking at kind of the policy response because obviously in developing countries, a lot of countries will not have the trillions of dollars like the U.S. to put, push out cash to low-income people and to the, the, the financial, institu- uh, financial institutions. And so we are looking to understand, well, what are policymakers doing in terms of um, their response? What are the responses that are the most that could be the most impactful for uh, low-income people, but also micro and small enterprises, and also for accelerating the digital economy, which we know is is needed. This, what this pandemic has shown us more than anything else is that organized, or, you know, companies that are online are, are actually the ones that are doing better. Um, and so, you know, that's that's a key learning here. And so we're seeing this is actually going to be uh, accelerating kind of the digital transformation of, of a lot of economies. Yeah, that's what I was I was thinking that just as you were speaking because I mean that while there's we we still don't know the how deep and long this this crisis is going to be there's already habits that I see changing now like I like when I if in the very few times I've been out and about in the last few weeks yeah, I don't. I don't use my credit card. I don't want to. I don't want to have anyone touch it. I use the contactless payment on my phone, and I'm using mm-hmm. Apple Pay when I go out and about. And uh, and then obviously, you know, the, the, there's everything that we can do online. You know, DoorDash and what have you uh, that you can do. That you know, for us, it's there's many many options. But I've been thinking about the developing countries and. You know, this, there could be a silver lining here, right? Where the, the, the silver, I mean, while the, the, many of these countries are going to be devastated economically, I'm, sh- I'm sure, but in the long run, do you think that this is going to be a catalyst that actually gets the, brings more people into, in, into sort of the, the financial system in a digital way? Absolutely. So I, I I'm an optimist by nature. <laughs> so I, I tend to, I tend to see the kind of, yeah, what's the silver lining in, in this situation? And then that is the one silver lining that I see. So undeniable, like, for example, there was some research that came out of China that uh, CAFI, which is a, 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 a kind of a think tank similar to CFI that's based out of China, they they actually looked at uh, micro and small enterprises in, in, in China, and they also looked at wage earners and low-income wage earners. And they, they found that, you know, those who are already – on e-commerce platforms, those who were already active in the digital economy had had actually no impact on their business. Can you imagine? Ten hmm. percent of those businesses actually increased their profits during the pandemic, and so those were the, exactly the ones that were able to just increase their delivery or increase their sales online or and so on. And so, but China is a little bit kind of further afield in the sense that it's a it's a much more developed digital ecosystem than sure. most other countries. Yep. So yes, we we kind of see where we could be going with with other uh, other markets, and that's I think where we as an industry we need to accelerate that 
the path to, to get there. It, it will not be easy because there's a lot of there's a, there's a lot of different countries at very very different stages of this kind of transformation. So there will be people who are going to suffer quite a lot, and 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 of course that's the tragedy. The the good news is there's there's been just a huge amount of focus on just getting cash out the door, um, which I think is absolutely warranted. So just most countries have announced you know increases in cash transfers. And and when where they have a, a digital ecosystem, that's gonna that's gonna be great and that's gonna be efficient and you're gonna get money out the door quickly. Where that ecosystem is not quite built out, this is this is gonna be a challenge. And and I'm not really sure actually it's still to be determined how that cash is gonna gonna be distributed. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, that makes sense. So so then I'm I'm curious about the the impact that you might like we've talked about women and how they're in developing countries specifically they really have been excluded. What do you think? What what what's your gut feeling on how this how this crisis is going to impact the gender gap? So so uh, one of the, one of the lessons that a lot of organizations that have been doing cash transfers have learned is that when cash transfers. The evidence shows that when cash transfers are targeted to women's accounts, these transfers are actually used, you know, in, in many cases to support the family, the family's food consumption, the family, you know, children's education and so on. And so there's been this movement to try to target cash transfer uh, programs to women. And so if, if we're talking about 80 plus countries expanding their cash transfer programs, and a lot of them doing so targeting women, I actually anticipate that you'll start to see um, more women entering the financial system. The challenge has always been, the challenge with this kind of path for women, I call it onboarding into the financial system. The challenge there is that unless there is value for women to stay and use that, those accounts that have been created for them, th- there's little impact that can be achieved. So you still, you there still has to be you know, value for women to, to continue to use those accounts, so whatever, whether it's a digital wallet or whether it's a bank account or whatever that the, the cash transfer system is using, there still needs to be value for women. And that's the piece where we as, an, as a community still need to do a lot more work because so far there's, we haven't yet made that happen. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. So then, I mean, there, there are certainly, I mean, when you look around the the fintech community these days, there there are certainly many companies that are focusing on the the underserved, both in this country and around the world. And I'm curious about what you think is needed in. I you mean, know, maybe you could talk about this country as well as as well as internationally. But what what do you think you know, fintech companies? You know, what more can they be doing, and what should they be doing to really you know to to help out? bring to help bring you know more people in and obviously they're thinking about it this is this is they're not philanthropic organizations these are organizations mm-hmm. that want to make a profit so what what do you see as their role uh yeah no i so uh, there's this organization called the mix which does which is which is a data and information hub for our industry and they've been i don't know if you've heard of this thing called inclusive fintech 50 which they've been looking at the fintechs that are that are serving the poor and so they just did a, a quick survey of several of, of these inclusive fintechs to see well what are, what have they been doing in light of COVID nineteen and and so some of the things that have that have been done have been you know limited in the sense of mostly they're waiving fees or they're or they're trying to put out information through their platforms some of them that that are that are doing digital credit some of them are issuing grace periods uh, or you know again canceling late fees and, and things of that nature. A uh, couple are also have been trying to put out uh, tools for micro and small enterprise enterprises to help them manage their cash flow or inventory and so on, and they're doing that for free for for now. So these are all very useful things, and I think that you know, of course, more of that would 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 help. But I I see an opportunity in particular related to the area that that I just mentioned, which is this this kind of massive increase in cash transfers, whether it's coming through the humanitarian community or whether it's coming through the government. The World Bank is also very, very uh, involved in helping to expand a lot of these cash transfer programs. So there's an opportunity for fintechs to really support in the distribution of this of this money, and then to add and layer on other services that they can work they can provide for 
you know, low-income people, but also the micro and small enterprises that will be participating in some of these schemes. Mm-hmm. So I see that as a huge opportunity. I know I, I don't know the U.S. market so well, but I I am familiar with is it called Propel in the U.S., which yeah. which is uh, apparently just recently partnered with Give Directly around helping to distribute you know a thousand dollars to low-income people in the United States that affected by coronavirus. Mm-hmm. So I, I could I see that kind of model as you know there's a huge opportunity here because there's going to be a lot of money flowing to these to low-income people and small businesses around the world and and maybe there's an opportunity for fintechs to participate they can do so more efficiently possibly than than other channels and and so i see it as as a kind of Mm -hmm, mm win-win okay well we're almost out of time but one more question before i let you go and just when you look at uh, your organization you said you've really really sort of pivoted to focus on on the the current crisis but uh, maybe you could just tell, like, I presume that's what you're going to be focused on for the rest of this year, but you know, maybe beyond that, tell us some of the priorities that you're going to have down the road. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to, to, to speak to that as well. So we want to continue our work on consumer protection. So this is uh, one of the core strengths of CFI. I think what we're, what we're trying to do in this next, kind of the next phase on consumer protection is really delve deeper into how do we how do we make sure that the new players, whether it's the big techs or the fintechs or whatever, are how can they embed consumer protections in their design in their products? So that's a, a big area that we want to focus on. We also care a lot about regulators and and supervisors and how they are able to understand when you know when, when there is harm in a market. So we want to elevate our work with them on market conduct. In terms of, kind of on the consumer side, we are prioritizing, like I mentioned earlier, work on women's financial inclusion. And, and also we want to prioritize kind of the, you know, issues related to the role of financial services and help people, help people adapt to, to climate change. So we recognize that there's a lot of poor people whose lives are going to be impacted by this global issue. And we need to be thinking about the role of financial services in helping them do that, whether it's increase in access to insurance or whether it's uh, helping people, you know, use financial services to to migrate or to, you know, just completely change their source of livelihood. Mm-hmm. So linked to some of these is also just this issue around, you know, as the digital economy takes hold, big issues around data and data privacy, and that's so that's another area we've identified as uh, as an area of focus. So we want to really understand, kind of, in low in low capacity countries. You know, how should we be thinking about um, data rights? How should we be thinking about data privacy and so on? So these are these are the things that we've identified for mm-hmm. our, our long term agenda. Interesting, interesting. Well, we'll have to leave it there. Good luck. Uh, it certainly Thank is you so much. certainly is a noble noble mission. I really appreciate you coming on the show today, Mayada. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Okay. See ya. Bye bye. You know, I tend to be an optimist as well, and. As horrific as this crisis is for many, many people, those who have lost loved ones, those that have lost their job, I don't mean to understate that, un- underplay that at all. I feel like that, that there, are, there are many people that are struggling severely right now. But taking a bigger picture look, and I, I think there's a good chance we're going to look back at 2020 and see that, there, that there's a lot of change that's going to come out of this. Many, you know, many great companies were, were, were sort of were created out of the financial crisis of 08, 09. So I think we're going to see a lot of new approaches, new companies that haven't even started yet that are going to have a dramatic impact, not just on financial inclusion, but on how financial services are delivered around the world. We certainly have talked, we talked about the contactless list Piece, but there, I think there's there's so much opportunity to do things in a better and more efficient way, and I think this uh, this crisis is going to be a catalyst for those kinds of changes. Anyway, on that note, I will sign off. I very much appreciate you listening, and I'll catch you next time. Bye. Today's episode was sponsored by Lended Fintech USA, the world's largest fintech event dedicated to lending and digital banking. It's happening on our new dates of September 30 and October 1st at the Javits Center in New York. This year, with everything that's been going on, there will be so much to talk about. It will likely be our most important show ever. Come and join us in New York to meet the people who matter, to learn from the experts and get business done. Lended Fintech, lending and banking connected. Sign up today at lendit.com slash USA.